Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to this week's installment of the Stanford uh, Cyber Policy Center's uh, webinar series. I'm Andy Grotto, uh, former senior director uh, for cyber policy in the National Security Council and the Obama and Trump White Houses, and now the director of the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance uh, here at Stanford. I uh, guide the curriculum for the cyber policy specialization in Stanford's uh, Ford Dorsey Master's in International Policy program and teach the core uh, cyber uh, policy fundamentals uh, class for the specialization. Our usual host, Kelly Bourne, uh, will return next uh, week. Um, our focus of discussion today is on navigating U.S.-China uh, uh, technology futures. Uh, how can the U.S. Uh, address uh, security and values challenges uh, when it comes to U.S.-China uh, technological cooperation, uh, while still encouraging innovation, uh, what are the impacts, uh, the human impacts to researchers, students, and others with ties to China uh, when excessive and misguided policies are potentially in uh, play? I'm joined by a distinguished group of, of experts and thought leaders. Uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Pan is an assistant professor of communications and an assistant professor by courtesy of political science and sociology here at Stanford. Um, she uh, focuses her research um, at the intersection of um, uh, political communication and authoritarian, authoritarian politics, um, uh, showing how authoritarian governments try to control society, how the public responds, and when and why each is successful. Uh, Graham Webster is a research scholar and editor in chief of the Digit China uh, project uh, within the geopolitics and technology uh, program uh, and a digital economy fellow. Uh, at New America. Uh, Graham is based at Stanford uh, and he leads an interorganization network of specialists uh, to produce analysis and translation of China's digital policy uh, development. He researches, publishes, and speaks to diverse audiences on the intersection of US-China relations uh, and advanced technology. Uh, Jeff Ding is a pre-doctoral uh, fellow at CSAC um, at Stanford, uh, working towards a doctorate uh, from Oxford uh, Jeff's research is focused on how technological change affects the rise and fall of great powers uh, with an eye towards the implications of advances in AI for a possible U.S.-China uh, power transition. Uh, so our, our format for today is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to spend a few minutes uh, putting some ideas and thoughts on the table, uh, and then we'll open it up to discussion among them, and uh, we'd also love to hear uh, from all of you who've joined us um, uh, so, uh, Graham, why don't we start with you? Over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Andy, and greetings, everyone. From uh, uh, you know, it's supposed to look like it looks behind Andy in the background, but actually, this morning in in Northern California, that's uh, that's the view outside of uh, my Oakland uh, apartment. So, I just will let you all enjoy that a little bit. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, two basic uh, themes. Uh, each represented by a, a recent publication from our DigiChina project. Um, the first on all of the myriad ways that decoupling seems to be happening uh, between the US and China. Um, and the second on a, uh, a Chinese diplomatic initiative around data security uh, that was just released a couple of days ago. In both cases, um, there's a lot of sort of soaring rhetoric about national security and about uh, you know, values and governance, um, but these things all kind of boil down to uh, everyday barriers and everyday frictions uh, for researchers and business people and uh, students and uh, technologists. So I, I think it, it all tends to connect a little more concretely when you think about how, uh, you know, real developers of technology are going to experience decoupling or whatever you would like to call it. So um, I'm going to reference two pieces that we published, and I certainly recommend that uh, people who are interested look them up. Uh, the first is Mapping U.S.-China Technology Decoupling. Uh, we published it last month. It's written by uh, a, a really great team, uh, Yen Luo from the law firm Covington, Sam Sachs from uh, Yale and New America, Naomi Wilson from ITI, and Abigail Coplin from uh, Vassar. Uh, and what they did is they kind of systematically went through U.S. and Chinese policies 
to look at what types of policies are um, pushing in the direction of decoupling. And they found a big uh, variety um, of both policies and kind of uh, the intentionality behind them. So I'm going to go through a quick list of some of the things that are happening. And, and most of these uh, have really uh, ramped up over the last couple uh, years, but all of them have some origins that stretch uh, before the Trump administration, which I think is important given that we're in a political season. Um, this stuff certainly has taken on a different life in the Trump administration, but it's not entirely based there. So uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, good Chinese number eight uh, themes to go through really quickly. And I'm just going to do it quickly to set a scene um, and we can get into the details if we like in uh, discussion. The first is data governance, which I'm going to come back to in, in the second piece here. Um, this is an emerging field around the world. Governments have been figuring out that uh, handling data, managing it, uh, processing it uh, is a major uh, political challenge, especially as new uh, automation technologies and AI uh, come online. Um, from the US side, there's um, an element from the State Department's uh, clean initiative that includes clean cloud and worries about uh, keeping Chinese elements out of the cloud uh, infrastructure that US and allied countries would use. And from the Chinese side, there's all kinds of uh, rules that, that look at uh, data localization and, and, and control and, and standards for security. Um, biological security is a relatively new frontier, not just because of uh, the COVID pandemic, um, but also because, especially on the Chinese side, policies are scrutinizing the ways that uh, genetic and other biological data get shared in scientific collaborations. This sets up brand new challenges for researchers uh, in both countries uh, and in international medical co uh, cooperation. There's a heightened attention to supply chain security. Uh, this is something that many countries are experiencing, but certainly the US and China with respect to each other worry about whether the other countries' uh, components and products uh, would create security vulnerabilities uh, in their own country. Um, and then there's bans on apps. We're, we're trying to figure out right now whether the Trump administration is actually going to ban TikTok and WeChat. Uh, certainly the US uh, would be new to that game, uh, whereas China has been banning uh, apps for censorship reasons for, for uh, many years and, and back to the uh, basically the beginning of the internet in the late 90s um, in China. Uh, so we've got four more. Those, those are sort of the really intentional ones. And then there's four more that uh, are not so carefully, or no, not so intentionally about uh, splitting the two countries' technological ecosystems. Um, but they are about, uh, you know, specific policy goals and they have the effect of creating barriers for people who are going to do uh, business or collaborate across the border. Uh, so here we have export controls. Uh, this is something that uh, the U.S. uses fairly extensively uh, in the sanctions context um, and it's been ramping up as uh, the Trump administration has increased the, uh, the breadth of, of the firms that are targeted for various sanctions type reasons. Um, and this puts a lot of friction, basically compliance friction for researchers or business people who are trying to figure out whether their products or projects uh, have some uh, interaction with the export control regime. Uh, there's some developments on the Chinese side that, uh, that look at exporting key security related technologies, but it's fairly nascent there. Um, on the U.S. side, there's a proliferation of use of blacklists, uh, which is essentially related to this export control uh, machinery. Uh, but we have, I, I separate it out because it's a little bit different when you, when you list companies, uh, you know, in these large sets, whether it's for uh, a, a human rights purpose or for some other, uh, you know, decision about uh, uh, national security risks. By adding these companies and to these lists, it, it gives people yet more pause and, and adds even more friction uh, to how you're going to make a decision about doing business across the border because you might not know uh, whether your partners are connected to someone that might be on one of these blacklists. Two more, financial untangling. Uh, we have the, the potential that uh, Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges would essentially be uh, across the board delisted um, over very, really longstanding uh, differences in, in terms of 
auditing systems and, and whether Chinese companies are able to comply with U.S. Uh, uh, market regulations. There's been sort of an exception there for a lot of years, and that might close, uh, which would seriously, uh, you know, put barriers up for uh, the, the flows of capital and investment um, and the business relationships there. And then finally, we have uh, basic travel limitations. Of course, right now, very few people are traveling between the U.S. and China uh, because of the pandemic. But um, at the same time, more and more journalists are being thrown out uh, of each country. Uh, more and more researchers are having trouble getting visas. More students are being uh, searched at the border as they, as they leave the United States. Um, and this, I think, puts uh, a serious pressure on, on just the personal layer. I mean, as someone who, who uh, until the pandemic, was traveling to China three or four times a year, it really, uh, uh, you know, the more people worry about their safety and their ability to travel uh, with confidence between the two countries, you know, it, it has a direct impact on the, on the types of uh, trust that they can build with, with partners and, and collaborations that uh, are, you know, possible. So all of this sort of, it's a, it's a litany of barriers and some of them are, are based in, uh, most of them are based in very legitimate concerns about security or about uh, whether there's uh, entanglements with rights abuses in places like Xinjiang or, or elsewhere in, in China, um, or whether there's, you know, risks to the political integrity from the perspective of the Communist Party uh, of dealing with uh, U.S. partners. Um, but they all add up to uh, what increasingly looks like an insurmountable set of barriers for a lot of different types of collaboration. Um, the second piece that I want to mention very briefly, because I think I'm running out of time, is uh, that the Chinese uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, just a couple of days ago announced a new uh, uh, global data security initiative. Um, and, and this, I think, is worth noting because it's it's a move into the soaring rhetoric of diplomacy uh, where uh, the Chinese uh, side has not really been playing for the last few years in terms of uh, trying to claim global technological uh, governance leadership. Uh, the U.S. has been making some pushes, I think, with, with quite mixed success, but certainly the, uh, the State Department has, has been pushing this clean initiative, uh, which is essentially, I call it a no China's club because uh, it's it's fairly limited in, in its proactive proposals, but it has very strong preferences to avoid entanglement with China and, and to, to spread that type of uh, idea beyond the question of getting rid of Huawei from your networks. Um, the Chinese side now has its own uh, diplomatic rhetoric. Um, I note this to say that it's what we have in this new uh, you know, announcement isn't all that new from the Chinese policy perspective. Nothing in there uh, looks like something surprising to someone who's been watching Chinese uh, internet diplomacy uh, over the last decade or two. Um, but what you do see is a move to kind of separate uh, Chinese leadership from US leadership, different visions, both claiming to be open, but both uh, in the US case explicitly uh, trying to exclude uh, Chinese elements from, from many things and in the, in the Chinese case, uh, quite implicitly, but really clearly uh, targeting U.S. practices in this area. Um, the very last thing I'll say about all of this is that it does come at a time of a pandemic when cooperation is harder because it's harder for uh, researchers, students, business people, et cetera, to get back and forth. Um, it's also a time when the macro tensions in U.S.-China relations have led to uh, a very difficult time uh, for U.S. diplomats in China who, who don't get to talk to their counterparts as, as often as, uh, as they used to. Um, and I just want to emphasize that there's this sort of quiet <laughs> uh, that could either be before a storm or could be before um, a, a, an orientation to solutions that, that both uh, take uh, security and human rights and, and other concerns into account while also uh, prioritizing the uh, cooperation that could be done uh, both for, you know, for basic business uh, and science uh, purposes and also for uh, major international concerns like climate change, uh, public health, et cetera, where uh, cooperation between two huge uh, countries and, and research environments could really help. So that's all from me for now, but uh, speak more later. Great. Th thanks, Graham. Uh, so Jeff, over to you. Um, 
you know, Graham's, uh, Graham spent some time talking about um, this idea of decoupling, um, you know, first, obviously, the economies, but then with this global data initiative, um, you, you could look at that as sort of a, a, an attempt to try to decouple, uh, uh, the, you know, global uh, digital risk governance architecture as well, um, more explicitly. I'd love to hear your thoughts on on this this concept of uh, of decoupling and, and does it make sense? Uh, do you have a different view? That's a leading question. Fire away. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Graham gave a great overview of decoupling. Um, I I definitely agree that like there's um, a lot of evidence and a lot of justifications for um, a more decoupled relationship. Um, I've been trying to promote. Um, just for, I like having like a diversity of framings because I think there's a real danger when something becomes the single story of the US-China tech relationship. So I think decoupling, there's a danger that that has become the single story. Um, so my alternative framing is um, hashtag coupled for life. And you can change the four to the number four if you want. You can add a Y to replace the I. Um, but the idea is just that the US and China are still very interdependent, especially technologically. And I'll just give a few indicators as to why. Um, that show actually we're, we're growing more technologically interdependent, even amidst all of the decoupling. Um, so China's payments for the use of US IP, which is a key statistic to see like what profits are you actually making from the sale of technology. Um, that grew from 755 million in 1999 to 8.3 billion in 2017. That's the latest report of the St. Louis Fed. Um, China's the U.S.'s top collaborator on science and engineering publications. So 26% of the U.S.'s internationally co-authored publications are with China. And the U.S. is the same for China, the top collaborator. 44% of China's international publications are with a U.S. co-author. Um, and that's also from the latest NSF report, 2018 figures. Um, we talked a little bit about export controls. Um, obviously, there have been a ramp up of those in certain sectors. Um, but in some of the most fundamental technology um, that's being developed open source um, and increasingly so. And it's, um, it's very difficult to place export controls on open source um, technology. Actually, the only justification for it under current export uh, regulations in the US would be if it involved encryption. Um, so I, I do think that there's a lot of um, sort of structural factors that are going to um, keep us coupled uh, for life. And then the question that a lot of what um, Graham has laid out in the overview is like, how do we balance all of these competing interests? And I might just like lay out sort of like a lot of the, the benefits from this sort of interdependence um, might include like, you know, protecting um, sort of the personal individual lives that Graham has mentioned that are in, um, that are being impacted by uh, fraying of ties. Um, and economic interdependence, uh, we benefit from uh, the product, our productivity benefits from research from other countries. So staying connected to China um, helps up, uh, keep up to date with the leading research and apply that quicker. Um, one, one study that tried to model like US productivity growth showed that like, even though we're the technology leader, 40% of US productivity growth comes from research advances from other countries. Um, there might also be like having ties um, increases diplomatic ties um, and um, dampens the risk of war. Uh, but of course, there's also a lot of the risks that Graham has outlined as well, um, not just with um, complicity and ties to human rights abuses, but also um, uh, interference from the Chinese state. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of different benefits and risks to balance as we talk about decoupling and maintaining um, the coupled for life relationship. Um, and then I'll just touch on one um, issue that hits pretty close home for me is when we talk about decoupling as a Chinese American. Um, I was born in Shanghai, China, moved to Iowa when I was three. Um, so I, I think at least for me speaking, when I hear decoupling, it's almost like, you know, you feel like your insides are being torn apart, especially with like the WeChat um, ban, where like that's how um, I call my grandma. Um, you know, every week. Um, so like that, like that in itself is not going to change if like WeChat gets banned, I'll just find a different way to call her. But I, I do think it will affect um, a lot of the thinner ties um, in which like um, people were all talking to in China, oftentimes in WeChat groups. 
um, those thinner ties are just much more easily sustained um, by having WeChat still be open um, and allowing those channels to be uh, smooth and open. Um, and also uh, you see one of the, I'll just expand on one of the risks that um, Graham outlined in more detail, which is just um, targeting of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans by immigration policies. Um, so one empirical study um, of the Cardo from the Cardozo Law Review um, found that the application of the Economic Espionage Act um, disproportionately charged um, Chinese and Asian Americans. Um, they tended to receive much longer sentences and um, were also significantly more likely to be innocent um, than defendants of other races. Um, so, so I do think that um, that's another uh, very tangible risk um, from decoupling and how it affects um, the lives of Americans. Um, but yeah, happy to bounce off of um, any of those ideas in the Q&A. And, and I'll end it with kind of one thing that I'm fearful of on this topic, which is just, uh, there's an interesting historical analogy for all this. Um, back in the early 20th century, um, uh, leading Germany was the leading science and technology power at the time. And um, there was a lot of concern over the proportion of foreign students studying electrical engineering, which is kind of the hot new sexy technology of that era. Um, and it was like 72%, really high. Um, and if you look at numbers in the US of like foreign students um, in AI programs, computer science programs, it's also pretty high and there's like concerns about this dependency. Um, and some um, feared that like foreign electrical engineering students in Germany would transfer knowledge back to their home countries, enable them to compete successfully with Germany. So you see all these like familiar overtones still today. Um, and then Germany actually began to restrict the number of foreign students. Um, and behind this was this like growing chauvinistic resentment um, in Germany. And um, eventually, like we saw um, how some of that chauvinistic resentment may have played into World War I. Um, so it's a loose historical analogy, it's imperfect, but um, I do think that there is a sphere that we, um, to, to avoid um, turning more inward. Um, and uh, yeah, how we can maintain this sort of balance that we're trying to achieve. Great. Th thanks, Jeff. Um, before turning it over to Jen, I, I want to uh, put in a quick plug for uh, Jen's book, um, which I think she's uh, maybe too modest to, 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 to uh, pitch here, but I, I will do it. Um, uh, so, so Jen has uh, an amazing book um, uh, out uh, uh, from Oxford University Press called Welfare for Autocrats, um, How Social Assistance in China uh, cares for its rulers. And in the book, um, she shows how China has reshaped um, its major uh, social assistance program um, around this preoccupation of maintaining, uh, 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 this preoccupation by the Chinese Communist Party of maintaining power and how they've sort of transformed this, this um, social assistance program into a tool for uh, surveillance and, and repression. It's a, it's a a, a fascinating uh, read. I highly recommend it. You could find it on Amazon. Uh, end plug. Uh, Jen, over, over to you for your thoughts. Thank you for that. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So I study uh, domestic Chinese politics and also uh, Chinese public opinion in China, then the Chinese public, both in China and those who are abroad. And I just want to make two points. And I think the first um, pick, picks up on uh, what Jeff just talked about. And it's the fact that regardless of what policies are made, there is a need to differentiate between the Chinese regime, the Chinese Communist Party, the governance structure, its political institutions, and Chinese people. And to recognize that Chinese people are not equated, should not be equated to the, to the regime. Um, the second point I want to make uh, is more about how the Chinese government's um, activities in controlling information are being shaped by the affordances of social media platforms. Okay, so on the first point, in terms of this need to differentiate between the regime and people, um, in a new paper with a couple of co-authors, we show that racist anti-Chinese rhetoric boosts support for the Chinese regime among a new generation of Chinese students in the US who are most likely to subscribe to democratic values. 
So this is part of a longitudinal project where we're trying to understand the lives and perspectives of Chinese undergrads who are studying in the US. Um, we've been surveying hundreds of uh, Chinese students, following them from their freshman year. Uh, they're at over 60 colleges across the US. Uh, and in this past spring, we conducted a survey where we embedded an experiment to look at the effects of anti-Chinese racism. And I should say that with research partners in China, we're also conducting similar surveys with hundreds of students at the top three universities in China. So one of the first things um, uh, we find is that when you compare students, Chinese nationals, students who are in the US versus those who are in China, students in the U Chinese students in the US are much less nationalistic and more politically liberal than their peers in China. So those who are coming to the US to study are much more predisposed to support uh, Western liberal democracy and to be less supportive of the Chinese regime. So I think that's just an empirical fact to keep in mind because there's often this conception that Chinese students come to the US and they're super nationalistic. If we compare them to their peers who stay in China, they're much less nationalistic and more liberal. So in the experiment, we, um, in the survey, I should say, we embed an experiment to measure the effect of exposure to racially derogatory comments. And um, I just wanna share, I am gonna share a slide um, to make this a little bit easier. So this is the, um, wait, is, am I sharing the nationalism or this one? Okay, so hopefully you guys see the three treatment groups. Um, we have a control group where uh, students are randomly assigned to a group to read a Chinese language article about Dr. Li Wenliang, who is the doctor from Wuhan, uh, known for speaking out about COVID in the early days and who subsequently died of the disease. Then they read comments we collected from Chinese social media criticizing the Chinese government's initial handling of COVID-19. So that's the control group. Then people are, uh, some third of people are randomized into the first treatment group, treatment A. There they're reading a US news article about uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, very similar, just fact-based article. Then they read social media comments, uh, US from 10 comments we collected from US social media that criticize the Chinese government for its handling of COVID. And in the last treatment group, this treatment B, uh, they read the same US news article, uh, but in addition to commentary that's critical of the Chinese government, they also read uh, racially derogatory comments that blame Chinese people for the spread of COVID-19. Okay, so these are our students are randomly assigned to these three treatments. We then ask students on all three groups the same questions to measure their support for the Chinese political system. And what we find, uh, okay, can you all see this result now, hopefully? Oh, we cannot, we can only see the, at least in my yeah. screen, the, 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 okay. the all right. middle so gray boxes. Okay, so let me see if I can get the results. Um, hopefully now you are seeing the yeah, results. So um, in each of these figures, is the, each figure is a different question. Each figure shows three uh, bars and estimates, one the leftmost for the control group, the center for the first treatment where they see the cr critical comments, and then the third where they see this mixture of critical and racially derogatory comments. And what we see very clearly is that if students are exposed to criticism, uh, from US social media, it doesn't really change uh, any of their expressed preferences. But when they encounter these racially derogatory comments, they're more likely to say that despite flaws, China's political system is suitable for China's current situation, that China's system is not inferior to Western developed countries or Western democracies, and that nothing in particular about China's political system needs improving. Um, so what this shows us is that encounters with racism have an effect um, beyond, possibly beyond the individual level, in that it changes how these students perceive how China should or should not change. So the one thing I should clarify is that we're not asking them to change about their evaluations of US democracy or US society. What we're interested in is how does this change their ideas about ref potential reform in China. And what we see is that racism here has a consequence beyond its effect just on individuals um, and with possible implications for US-China relations and China's future political development. Okay, so that's the first point about the need to separate kind of policies toward the Chinese regime and how Chinese people 
um, are treated. So the second point is, um, I'll just talk about it really quickly. It's about how the Chinese government's efforts at controlling information is being shaped by the affordances of social media. So I've done a lot of previous research on censorship and um, disinformation that shows how the Chinese government is able to exert a high level of control on its domestic information environment. But in a more recent paper um, called Capturing Clicks, How the Chinese Government Uses Clickbait to Compete for Visibility, I show that the advertising-based revenue model of Chinese digital media platforms is shaping the Chinese government's efforts at propaganda. So we look at um, data from WeChat. We collect information from over 200 city-level Chinese government WeChat accounts from 2018 to 2019. And uh, my co-author also spent a couple of months at online propaganda offices in a couple of different places in China. And what we find is that there's huge pressure from Beijing on local governments to use social media as a direct to public communication channel. So whether it's WeChat or Douyin or other live streaming um, um, apps, there's this perception that it's interesting. There's a perception among the Chinese government that Chinese state media is too commercial. So we tend to think of Chinese state media as completely state controlled, but there's this idea that they're now too influenced by commercial incentives. And so they want local governments to be able to have a way of speaking directly to the public, um, especially when sudden unexpected events happen. And in order to do that for local governments, they have to be able to build an audience. And what we find is that they're resorting to non-propaganda content, like lifestyle entertainment to capture audience, but much more so they're using clickbait titles, like what you would see on BuzzFeed, uh, in order to get clicks, um, because they're evaluated and compared one another quantitatively in their ability to generate views and likes. Um, so I think this is a, it's kind of a, it was a fun project, but I think more broadly it shows that digital media and digital technology information communication technologies are shaping behaviors of the chinese government even though the chinese government is able to exert a lot of control um, on these technologies i'll stop there thank you great th thank thank you jen um so for those uh in the audience i i've, I've put um links to um the decoupling report uh that graham mentioned along with uh, the digit china uh, Global Data Initiative Translation. I've also put links to um, Jen's uh, book. Uh, I chose Amazon just because. Uh, and then um, I also added uh, um, uh, Professor Pan's uh, clickbait article and then uh, Graham, as you'll see, just added her article on overseas students. Um, so th th those are the, the, the reports that we've, we've uh, been talking about um, in our discussions so far. I think, you know, maybe Jeff, question for you. I mean, since you study um, how uh, technological uh, uh, innovation uh, can shape um, sort of great power competition and uh, transitions, um, I, I, do you, I mean, do you view the U.S.-China um, technological competition as a zero-sum game or a non-zero-sum game? You know, and the answer matters a lot, right? If it's a zero sum game that that points to, um, I think a, a a you know a much um, more you know uh, aggressive approach to decoupling. Um, if it's a non zero sum game, then you know there are more trade offs involved, um, and, uh, and and a more nuanced um, approach uh, would be uh, advisable. Mm -hmm. Love to get your thoughts, and then if, if Graham or, or or Jen have thoughts, uh, please weigh in as well. Yeah, I would say maybe just the cleanest way to answer that would be um, it would be a zero sum game if there were just two players playing. Um, but we have to remember that, like, uh, you have a lot of um, countries that are close to the technological frontier eager to sort of um, do what I was saying in my remarks, which is um, have outposts in China, have R&D labs in China picking up the latest advances attracting Chinese students, attracting the next generation of talent, um, getting plugged into these global innovation networks. Um, so if you account for uh, the rest of the world, um, it doesn't make sense to think about things in a, a zero sum game because if you punish China um, by like 
preventing Chinese students from coming to U.S. universities in the sense that like it'll uh, it'll hurt us, but it'll hurt them more um, when there's more players. Uh, those Chinese students can just go to other countries. Um, so then that logic doesn't make sense anymore. Um, happy to unpack that more um, if people have questions about that, but that would be the cleanest way to think about it. Great, thanks, Jeff. Before others jump in, I, I wanna remind um, our, our uh, viewers that if you have a question, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, you'll see uh, the, the Q&A tab in, in your Zoom uh, dashboard. Uh, so feel free to drop a question there and I will relay it to um, uh, the group uh, as best I can. Jen, Grandma, do you guys want to say anything on, on, on zero sum versus non-zero sum? Um, I, I have one thing to add on that, which is just to say that um, so much of the discussion that is being had about US-China relations now is sort of in a competitive frame. Uh, and I think sometimes that's apt. I mean, it, for, for years, the US and Chinese militaries have been trying to figure out ways to uh, develop capabilities that would target each other's relative weaknesses in case there's a contingency around something like Taiwan or North Korea or something else. Uh, and there's all sorts of competition about who can spy on each other better for national security purposes, really classic, uh, you know, big country power competition stuff. Um, and then there are differences uh, of another category uh, that some people view as competitive. And I think it's a, a, a little bit harder to, to be clear. And so the competitive frame is that uh, there are, is to say that there are competing uh, models represented by the United States and China, and that each is trying to uh, export those models or sort of defend them anyway around the world. And these are, you know, the, the cartoon version is that uh, the U.S. model is um, liberal democracy and the Chinese model is, uh, you know, a particular Maoist Leninist authoritarianism. Um, I think that that layer is not as clearly competitive uh, and so can't be as clearly looked at as a zero sum game because uh, a lot of it really boils down to uh, what the countries say and what they do uh, and who believes them. And so that where, where I think it's more concrete to think about from the perspective of US policy uh, is not to say, you know, there's a competition of models between the US and China, but to say instead uh, that there are things on earth that uh, people who believe in democratic values and in human rights would like to see change in China and elsewhere in the world. Uh, and that the Chinese Communist Party and the, and the government uh, it leads um, is party to uh, some really horrifying human rights violations. And, and so if you think of that as a problem to be approached in terms of how can this be changed and how can it be effectively uh, you know, moved, uh, it's not necessarily competitive as in the US has to become more powerful. It, you can think about it as, as Jeff mentioned, as, as a, in a world where there are many different actors and what types of pressure and costs can be imposed. And then the, the, this type of analysis leads to the, the, the really hard uh, realization that sometimes there is not sufficient leverage uh, in one country or even among men, many countries to change certain behaviors uh, without very high costs. But I think that ca calculation and that argument, um, separating that from the basic national security competition, which we've been having for years, um, can be a lot more clarifying and can uh, make it more uh, possible to see how that there, there are, you know, sort of technological or scientific or educational or sort of just regular people to people relationships that do not uh, significantly implicate the, uh, you know, the human rights issues or don't significantly implicate the, the military uh, strategic competition, uh, but could have other benefits. And you can measure those benefits there if you don't see it as, you know, one big country versus another big country in a comprehensive manner. So I, I know that that was a little meandering, but I, I think it's helpful to kind of disentangle uh, what it is that, uh, is being competed about. Mm -hmm. So um, last month, uh, the Trump administration um, uh, essentially had these two executive orders that that um, that ban, threatened to ban uh, TikTok and WeChat. And um, 
you know, there's sort of two reasons that um, that have you know really been put forward as the drivers for that decision. One is the the risk that um, that the Chinese government uh, would would steal information uh, uh, about users, uh, American users. Uh, the other um, is a little more subtle, and and I'd love to get um, uh, Jen's thoughts on this, uh, given her her research on uh, Chinese government's use of technology uh, for repression is that this concern that um, that the algorithms uh, you know in in in, in WeChat that, that drive WeChat that, that drive TikTok could be manipulated uh, to support um, some combination of, of censorship and um, and you know um, and direction of, of favored content or propaganda to to users. Jen, I, I, I'd love you to say a little, you know, give, give your thoughts on that. I mean, do you, you know, based on your research so far, um, do you do you find that argument persuasive and um, help help us put the the risk into uh, perspective? Yeah, so I think the fear is that there would be algorithmic manipulation that people cannot detect or that are so subtle that it is able to change people's minds yet not be detectable when it's doing that change. I just think that's very, very unlikely. So one thing to note is that TikTok, um, uh, the Chinese branding of TikTok Douyin uh, is subject to Chinese propaganda. Uh, when you see trending videos, some are organic trending videos and other is propaganda content. It's extremely obvious which are being pushed to trending and which are organic trending, um, even for users in China. Uh, so I think it, it, like that, that we can say is algorithmic manipulation, but it's very hard for me to imagine algorithmic manipulation that happens and is persuasive and influential, which no one is able to detect. Um, uh, especially in a place like the US where there is free media. I think if there's um, censored media for a long period of time, there could be information manipulation happening um, more subtly over years. Um, but it's, I think it's very unlikely to imagine happening in the US. WeChat is different. So I think each platform has to be taken separately because its affordances and features are so different. So WeChat, I think one thing that um, a lot of U.S. users who are less familiar with WeChat may not recognize is that the core functionality of WeChat is not a newsfeed like Twitter or Facebook. So when you open WeChat, you look at groups of your conversations, like my conversations with high school friends, college friends, um, people I worked with in my first job. Uh, that's what you see, and you see alerts for who has been talking. You could also go to a moments, which is more like a feed um, in WeChat. So I, I think it, that that's just something to for people to recognize that because of the core affordance of WeChat, you don't see it like the type of news feed algorithmic manipulation that you might imagine happening on a Chinese equivalent of Facebook and Twitter is just not uh, not core to the platform. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Graham, any, anything to add to that point? No. So um, th there's, uh, oh, I see some, let me check the Q&A here. Okay. Um, great. So uh, I'm going to start with a, a question um, from uh, Ryan Sullivan, who uh, writes uh, that Eric Schmidt recently put forward the idea of, quote, safe lanes unquote, of cooperation for US-China competition. Uh, more aptly, he used uh, the term cooper ition to reflect the competitor cooperation dichotomy. With regard to AI or other emerging technology, what are some of uh, those safe li lanes? Uh, well, I guess first question is, do you guys agree? Uh, and maybe Jeff, I'll start with you on this. Do, do you agree with 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 this this notion of of safe lanes? And if, if so, um, and any thoughts on um, what some of those safe lanes um, uh, might be, where the U.S. and China could conceivably cooperate? Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a really good question. I don't know um, all the stuff um, that Eric Schmidt has embedded within the safe lanes concept, but I do think in principle. Um, the vast 
I think my starting point is just like the vast majority of cooperation is safe. Like all the statistics that I mentioned at the beginning, which is like um, the sales of IP, um, like right, 8.3 billion sales of IP, hundreds, thousands of strategic alliances, um, top collaborator on all these publications. Um, now we've highlighted some troubling cases um, and there's been really good reporting of like troubling cases where like um, in the AI space, for example, um, research that is like targeted towards uh, identifying Uyghur faces um, or uh, natural language processing research um, in that domain as well. That's definitely um, not safe and very problematic. Um, but I just, I guess my starting point is just like the vast majority is safe. And I think if we reframe it from that point, um, it's just funny to think that like you even need this safe lanes concept. Maybe like the concept should be like, where are the danger zones? Um, so if you start with like everything's safe and then you highlight the danger zones, um, maybe a potential reframing. Um, yeah, I think even in some of the trickiest areas like facial recognition, um, there's already stuff happening. Um, there's like, um, like every day there are, every working day of the year, there are like seven meetings of like bureaucrats talking about boring things related to technical standards. And you have those conversations with facial recognition as well as like Tencent, Alibaba, all the big US banks, all the big Chinese banks talking about how do we identify people using things other than passwords? And how do we do that through a secure facial recognition system? Um, now, obviously that has spillovers to surveillance, but within certain bounded domains, uh, like even tricky things like facial recognition, there's already safe cooperation um, happening. Graham, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I just thought it was a kind of an interesting echo. Um, part of what Jeff was saying was that perhaps a you know a blacklist approach rather than a whitelist approach. If if Eric Schmidt is saying we need safe lanes, that's essentially a whitelist saying oh this area, you know these delineated areas are just fine. Um, and whereas a blacklist is to say well you know let's not share advanced missile technology with the people with whom we might have a missile festival later. Um, and I think that that, you know, thinking back uh, about a decade or, or a little bit less, um, you know, the, the Obama administration spent an, a huge amount of energy uh, with China uh, pushing toward uh, what used to be a potential bilateral investment treaty. Um, and part of that move was that the U.S. and other countries were pushing the Chinese side to shift their investment environment from essentially a whitelist uh, a positive list where these are the areas where uh, foreign investment is allowed and significant uh, measure uh, to a negative list, which uh, delineates the areas where uh, foreign investment is not allowed or whether where it's, it's significantly limited. Um, you know, and it used to be the case that the U S policy was pushing in that direction. And then it sort of seems that uh, the zeitgeist has gotten around to um, needing someone like Eric, Eric Schmidt to say that there's a, uh, uh, you know, a clear lane or, uh, uh, but that I think ref reflects a huge change in, in the debate uh, that I don't think has sort of uh, percolated down into the details as people work out uh, the, uh, the, the various industrial and, and scientific and kind of civilizational implications. And I say civilizational because, you know, this isn't my job, but uh, you know, as Andy knows, I'll never shut up about it, but I, uh, I really think that we have to think about the climate when we think about macro US China uh, relations and also, and especially in the science and technology area. Um, if we have a situation where uh, various technologies that could have transformative impacts on, uh, on climate adaptation uh, are developed in isolation and perhaps lack the, um, the connections and the sort of creativity that could come from, from exchanges across uh, the U.S. China divide, or across, you know, even worse, perhaps, perhaps if there are two blocks uh, where where various other countries refuse to cooperate with one another, uh, you know, that could really be a, a barrier to uh, to something that could prevent, uh, you know, things like what's in my background here from becoming super common around the world. Um, I think that that kind of basic common interest um, should be reflected in the way that. Uh, research is approached, and, and I, I would certainly uh, second what Jeff said about essentially <laughs> the default ought to be openness. Um, but I do say, I mean, the theme of this this session is to say that 
there are legitimate security concerns. And some of those things, uh, supply chain security, data governance, these are really uh, more salient for national security, for uh, you know, intellectual property protection, for fair business, uh, and for human rights issues uh, than they used to be a few years ago, I think. I, you know, as, as more and more um, parts of society are dependent on, on uh, advanced technology around the world, um, I don't think that that concern is misplaced. I just think it ought to be uh, handled in a more targeted way than, than we're able to do just yet. Thanks, Graham. I want to maybe shift to a, a slightly different theme and come back to um, Professor Pan's research on, on Chinese students. We have a question uh, as to whether your, um, your, your surveys uh, factor in how long the students have stayed in the U.S. Does this length of stay affect their perceptions of um, the Chinese system? Yeah, so that's something we'll see because we're following these students. Um, we'll follow them over years. Um, so that's something we'll see and we can't answer yet. Looking through the questions, I actually see a lot about AI um, surveillance technology. I just want to kind of follow up on what Jeff and Graham are saying. Let's say, um, let's say surveillance technology or deep learning surveillance technology is on a blacklist. Actually, I, it's like part of it, part of my thinking is like, how do you, de how do you determine what exactly is the thing that's blacklisted? So when I think about, I use deep learning algorithms all the time for in research, whether it's on image data or text data. And I actually benefit a lot from the developments that are happening in China um, in working with Chinese text. So I'm here in the U.S. working with Chinese text. I know there are other folks in China working with Chinese text and image data. And that transfer of information is very helpful and productive. And if we think about um, kind of putting a stop on the, the algorithms that are being used potentially in these surveillance um, technologies, that can actually have downstream impacts on a lot of other areas. So where does the, where should the line be drawn if there are such blacklists? I don't have an answer, it's more of a question. The other reflection is just that if there is more decoupling, it's hard for me to understand how the US can effectively put more pressure in the sense that if there's more decoupling, it's gonna be much harder to understand what's going on. Um, for kind of something that I've been working on in particular is how, uh, whether it's local governments or companies working on AI and surveillance in China, how do they make decisions about training their algorithms? So when you are training a model, you have to optimize for something. Your F1 score decisions. Those are the details that then determine whether lots of people who have done nothing wrong are put under surveillance or not, right? Those are the, those are the technical decisions. But if there is kind of separation of technologies, it becomes much harder to get that information to really understand how these algorithms and how these um, kind of technologies are being used. Thank you. Um, we have two questions in the mix on on um, one from uh, from our, our good friend Ian Wallace at New America on um, the uh, the how much confidence uh, we might have in uh, the ability of 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 China and the United States to push their respective clean network and, and global data security initiatives, and in particular, how confident are we? Um, in, 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 in uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party's ability to promote, uh, compete in that uh, scenario. And I think a, a closely related question um, from, uh, from Jeremy Kirschbaum is, you know, how this might play out depending on, uh, on the election uh, that we have coming up in here in the United States uh, soon. And I, I'm going to perhaps exercise the moderator's prerogative and uh, take a stab at, at answering that. Um, before we give people, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw up a toss up a, um, a Venn diagram here that I think tries to capture um, what a Biden versus Trump administration might look like. Um, everybody can see that. Um, this is sort of a, you know, my, my stab at, at kind of um, free associating some ideas with both, with both of the two candidates. Uh, I think that, you know, 
that one one thing they have in common though um, is I think both will will see a need to continue to confront China uh, across the board uh, from human rights, technology, you name it. And I think if there's a you know that that where where there will be one significant difference, and this comes to, to back to Ian's uh, point, is I, I suspect that. Um, the a Biden administration would would put a lot more investment in and, and ultimately more successful recruiting allies to to join uh, in, in a more multilateral fashion um, U.S. diplomacy on you know ac across the gamut across the range of issues with China and, and I, I don't think you really see that um, on 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 the 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 Trump administration and so I think you know China you know, may have more success uh, promoting its vision under a Trump administration than a Biden administration. Um, but um, obviously that's, you know, uh, we're sort of projecting into the future here. Um, we've got about two minutes left. I want to give um, our, our panelists if any, any last words before I ask um, our uh, David Havasey, my colleague, to put up our, our schedule for uh, uh, upcoming webinars to close us out. Any, any any final words, guys? I was just gonna say that I've uh, been kind of I've been kind of harsh on the Trump administration um, in some of my comments, but I think like it's also um, we have to note that there there have been some decisions that have seemed uh, pretty reasonable with, uh, for like jumping off of Professor Pan's um, comment about export controls. Um, the BIS of the Department of Commerce in November 2018 they released like this big notice about. Uh, new export controls on foundational technologies like AI. Um, and actually the end result was actually a very narrowly targeted um, restriction um, just on deep learning um, for a graphical user interface that enables users to identify objects from satellite imagery. Um, so that has like a lot of military applications. Um, so I, I do think that points to like, we have the people pushing back in open comments to have a very narrow approach and there have been some decisions that have kind of struck this balance pretty well that we've been talking about. Thanks, Jeff. Any any other uh, parting words, uh, Graham or Jen? I'll just say very quickly that um, looking at the new Chinese uh, proposal on data governance, um, it's going to read as pretty hypocritical to a lot of countries around the world as frankly will some of the US initiatives. And so I don't worry too much about falling into a true, uh, you know, US versus China frame on uh, data governance, uh, at least not now uh, under these conditions. It's more about uh, making some noise. And I'm glad that uh, in this session, we've been able to get down below the, uh, you know, the, the big headlines and the tweets uh, for, for an hour or so. So thanks everybody. Jen, any, any, any parting? Great. Uh, well, thank you all. And, and um, you know, as, as these things go, we only have an hour. There, there are far more really good questions than we have time to tackle today. Um, but I do appreciate um, your all's engagement um, and, and uh, joining us today. Uh, David, if you would, um, to, to send us out, um, here's our schedule of, of uh, Cyber Policy Center events. Uh, same, same bat time, same bat channel, as it were, uh, through uh, December. Uh, and so on behalf of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, I want to extend a thanks to our panelists for sharing their uh, wisdom and experiences with us and to you all uh, uh, for, for, for joining us and, and, and spending some time with us uh, this morning on the West Coast. And with that, um, have a wonderful rest of your weeks. Thank you. <laughs>